The title of my sermon is Final Things. Um, we are coming to the end of our series on 1 John. 1 John is a very good book. It is, it is hard to preach because it's very repetitive. It's hard to, it has been a challenge to focus on what to say this time because he, try, he says everything over and over. And so we get to the final things, um, the final things to walk away with. If, if you remember back, I think a big part of what John is trying to do here is tell us how to live our faith in a way that we experience God as a living entity in our daily life. Rather than a concept, rather than something we think about on Sunday, we experience God and our faith in Jesus all the time. And there's a... the. The main idea that we want to get from this, as John closes his letter, he admonishes believers with three important responsibilities that are necessary to truly experience our faith in Jesus God. And it made me think there is a scripture in here that talks about a sin that leads to death. And it made me think of a friend of mine who has passed away. And I'm sure I have told stories about him before. Uh, he was a man that I met when I was in the desert. He and his woman showed up one day. Uh, and I was in my office at the church. This is in the desert in Southern California. And they were driving a 1973 Suburban. And if it wasn't for rust, there was only rust there to hold the sheet metal together on this Suburban. Uh, it had no no uh, um, no hood. They slept. They had been sleeping in it for weeks. Um, and he told me later that he had come to the church because there was only one church in Wonder Valley. There was about four thousand people. In you know in past descriptions, there was a fire station, there was a bar, a biker bar, and there was my little church there. And he said he came to the church, he had told me after, after we knew one another, that he came to the church because they had no income or possibility. I, you don't meet, in America, you don't meet truly destitute people. There's no such thing. Well, I have met some, uh, and it was David Goldbeck and Colleen. And he said he, they had discussed it, and they felt that there was a better chance that if they could find odd jobs that with people that went to church, that the people would pay them. And I, I hope that that is true. I, I think, I definitely think that in the midst, these, these were the two of the most sinful people I've ever met. And I... God was at work in their life in the midst of their sin. And David Goldbeck was the most contrary person. He would be so pleased that we're still talking about him. He passed away in 2009. He would be so pleased that we are still talking about him. He was so vain. And I'll tell you, if he had had a little bit of subtlety, he liked to tell his opinion too much, but if he had had a little bit of subtlety, he would have been a world-famous con man. He was brilliant, but you can't be a con man if you've got to tell your opinion, if you've got to shout your opinion all the time. He had been, he had worked, he had worked as a lawyer, though he had no law degree. He had gone into court and tried cases, though he had no law degree. He had worked as an airline pilot, though he had, had no certification. He had worked as he, a boat captain, um, and he had worked as a newspaper editor. In fact, he wrote an article. He was in Northern California. He wrote an article critical of Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood was the mayor of the next town over Carmel, California. And he wrote an article criticizing him as mayor 
as a newspaper editor, though he had no college degree, Clint Eastwood came into his office and threatened him. That's, that's, that's the kind of person we're dealing with. And he was, he was a drug addict. Another part of, that hurt his possibility of being a con man, he was, he was an alcoholic, a bad alcoholic. But he was a brilliant man, he, and he loved, you know how I like to tell what I think? He liked to argue with me. And so we were like this, this odd pair of friends. But so we hired him, Sarah and I hired him to do odd jobs because they had no other, they had no other way of making money at that point. They had, they had gone to the end of their rope. And I, I would not have believed it had I not seen it. And I've told you before, there was one time we were working in 29 pumps hanging drywall, doing a little contracting. And we were talking about the Bible, and we were yelling at each other so much doing that that the lady that owned the house came back and said, is everything all right? I said, it's okay. We're talking about the Bible. But he loved to argue with me. And I would say I spent, you know, we pray for opportunities to share the gospel with people. And I think God answered all my prayers with him. I think I, I, I almost want to say I used up all my terms because I shared the gospel with him. I would estimate 60 hours over time with this man. And he just argued with me. And I finally, after several years, I said, go back. You are eating your own tail. I have told you over and over. I've answered that question over and over. I can't tell you nothing else. It's between you and God now. I got nothing else. Do you believe this, Faye, that I would ever say this? I got nothing else to say. It's, it is hard to believe, isn't it? You know me. You know me well. 2000, it must have been 2007, because I remember that. Yeah, it was 2007. He called me. On Monday, Thursday, and and he said, Rex, I, you know, I asked. He was a cat. He is a he was an angry ex-Catholic, and he said I had asked God for a sign. That's very Catholic. I'd asked God for a sign. If he was real, give me a sign. Well, the sun set in a mountain peak. Or there was a V shape in the mountains. We, the valley, Wonder Valley, was surrounded by mountains. And it had settled, and it made a vertical shaft and a shorter horizontal shaft in that, as the sun set right in that peak at his house. He could see it from his house, and it made a cross, Monday, Thursday. And that's Catholics. And he said, I got down on my knees, and I prayed. Now, go back. When he came forward, I said, okay. I talked with him a little bit. I said, come Come forward on Sunday morning and make it public in front of the congregation. He come up, and what he and I won't quote what he said. He said, I, he said, Rex, I'm going to be a pain in your, you know what, and I'm going to be a pain in God's, you know what, but I'm in. Hallelujah. But that tells you who we're dealing with. Two weeks later, they found him to the day of him calling me, to the hour that he called me. They found his body on the side of the road. They said he looked like he was asleep. They said that he looked like he was the most peaceful that they'd ever seen him. I talked to the guy that found him. He went to the church in town. And he was dead. Now, I don't know what was going on. I do not understand God fully. I'm glad he wrote it down in the Bible so I could hook on to some things, some truths. I don't fully understand God. But I've come down to two possibilities for what was going on there. And I think probably both, and both define the God we serve. The first one is that God knew that his death day was coming. God knows all things. And God pulled him irresistibly. 
God, don't, don't ask God for signs. Have faith. The Bible says that faith is believing what you don't see. Don't wait for a sign. But God gave David Goldbeck a sign because he was about to die. Or the other possibility, and how this ties into our scripture in 1 John, is you got to be careful with God because God is holy. All right? We don't talk a lot about wrath and, and, and God, but our scripture today talks about a sin that leads to death, and most probably that is taking God for granted as a believer. And I think Gobeck's attitude about I'm going to be a pain, don't tell God you're going to be a pain in his rear end. That's it. I, the second possibility is that God took him out. He's going to be in heaven. I say it as surely as if I'm going to be there. But Christian, you've got to be careful the way you treat God. God is holy. And he's not for us. To, we can't talk to God the way we talk to other people. Uh, we're not going to. You, you just got to treat God as holy. So anyway, there are three on that interesting story. That is one of the most fascinating things that have happened to me, that person. And you, you will get to meet him, believer. You will get to meet him one day because of what Jesus did, not because of any goodness. And I'll tell you what, God showed me, oh yeah, I got to do my part. I, I told, go back to truth, but he did not get saved because of me. God made it very clear. I went to the end of my loop, believe it or not, and I could not save him, but God saved him. That is the only way. The only way is God. We've got to do our part. So let's, let's see if this makes any sense as we go through this. We get to the end. This is the purpose of John writing his letter. The number one responsibility that we all have is to ourselves, our personal belief in Jesus as our Savior, our only hope for connecting with God, our only hope for eternity. It says in 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So believe in the name of the Son of God. Son of God means the same essence of God. We, we took four weeks and we talked about theology. Jesus is fully God. That's what Son of God means. Son of man, which is not used in this passage, but Jesus refers to himself as son of man. And there are prophets in the Old Testament that are referred to as the son of man. That means that they're fully human. These are human beings with a special divine purpose. God, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And at times he would call himself son of God. At times he would call himself son of man. He says, call on the name of Jesus, that is the character and purpose. Jesus came to make salvation available to all people. Reconnection. Each, if you breathe, you were created to know God. Sin comes in between us. We break up with God. This is the reconnection. That was Jesus' purpose, to make that available to us. Uh, if if we believe and accept that the gospel is necessary for salvation, then we are saved. So next it says that you may know that you have eternal life. We talked about this last time. Uh, confidence in our salvation. Living a confident life. Uh, and the way First John says we show our confidence is by loving other people. Loving all other people. That you may continue to believe. And this is where we struggle. Salvation is a belief. And then uh, that is. It is what we believe. We believe that the cross is our only hope of salvation. And then it is declaring him Lord. Making Jesus the Lord of your life. That is an action thing. And it, the Bible says work at your faith with fear and trembling. And that doesn't mean work to make yourself build your faith. It means work at practicing your faith. 
action. Uh, that's confessing his Lord, and then we work at our faith. What do I say every week? Prayer and Bible. Prayer and Bible. You got to have more. We got to have more. Ultimately, all people, or in another way, each individual person in the world, 7.7 .7 billion currently, 107 billion over human history, will be held accountable for what we choose about Jesus. If you reject it or ignore it, you are held accountable. So the second responsibility that John talks about here in the final things is our responsibility to others. Am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes. And then he talks about the sin that leads to death. And that's why I told the story of David Goldbeck. I am not sure what happened there. 1 John 5, 16. If anyone sees a brother sinning a sin, that is a normal sin, which does not lead to death, at, pray for him. He will ask. And he, God, will give that person life for those who commit a sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that we should pray about that. That's out of our hands. Whatever the sin that leads to death is, and I'll give you two options in a moment. All unrighteousness is sin. Anything you do that disobeys God or prioritizes something above God in your heart is sin. And that's common to all people. Uh, and there is sin which is not the sin leading to death. So this is a rather confusing. I'll give you two possibilities. Um, this is one you need to go chew on at home uh, and, and meditate on. The possibilities. And that was the case I made with possible with with my friend that you are so bad defiant that God takes you out that God takes back the life that he gave you and an example in the Bible would be Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 Peter said Ananias why have you let Satan fill your heart now there's going to be a connection in first John with Satan uh, here in a minute why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. You have kept some money for yourself. Now, the problem is not keeping money for themselves. The problem is they said that they had given everything. They lied to the congregation. They lied to the Holy Spirit. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Sapphira came in. She, act, she did not know this had happened. She acted innocent too. She was struck dead. God will not be mocked. Be very careful that you treat God as holy. We, a Christian has a higher responsibility in their treatment and thought about God than a person that is separated to him, just naturally. Be careful the way you think about and treat God. Be honest with God if you're not honest with anybody else. And the second possibility of the sin that leads to death, which is less likely, is just the fact of rejecting the Holy Spirit's call to salvation. That is not accepting Jesus as your Savior. And we know that that leads to eternal judgment. That leads to the lake of fire. Okay? The second one is not likely because it says, there's nothing really you can pray about that. Other places in scripture it says pray for salvation for other people. So most likely this strange phrase, sin that leads to death, is a believer who is not treating God as holy. Who is treating God like you might treat another person. Be careful for that. The third responsibility is our responsibility to truth and thus rejecting the false. Rejecting the faults in our world and in our society. First, it reassures us. We said last week, be confident in your faith. 
And he goes on here to tell us that we are protected from the devil. If you are a believer, if Jesus dwells in your heart, you are protected. Verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God, that is the rebirth, born again is the phrase, that is justification. When we are born again, we are declared before God not guilty on the day of judgment. Justification. I'm giving you some 50 cent words here. Uh, whoever is reborn does not sin. We talked about that back previous. That is the regeneration of the soul. Our spiritual quality, your spiritual fingerprint is wiped clean at salvation. Sin stains your hands and your fingerprint. When you get saved, spiritually that is wiped off. Now we have to walk around. The great mystery, while salvation is so mysterious to us and so bizarre is, our, we are regenerated, our soul is regenerated, but we walk around in our sinful flesh and with our sinful habits. And we have to struggle, which is the third thing. But he who has been born of God, truly, keeps himself, works at his salvation daily, flees from things that cause us to stumble, uh, events, situations, people, television shows, video games, athletic events, garbage, garbage. There is so much garbage to look at and stare at in this world. If you are one who keeps himself, steers away from that stuff, tries to Fashion your life so that you're not interacting with those things that cause you to sin and displease your Savior. And this is the good news. The wicked one does not touch that person. Now, if you do not sanctify yourself and you interact with wickedness, you, you associate with people who do not love the Lord and do not care about right and wrong and morality, or even worse, are actively seeking to break rules and to do wrong, then the wicked one will mess with you. That's just common sense. If you entertain the weaknesses of your flesh, your sinful desires, if you, if you throw fuel on the fire, the devil is going to be all in your business. But you are given a pass on that if, as a regenerated person, you work at your holiness. Then God will keep the devil off your back. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. And that explains why it is so complex. We all know people that are fired up for the Lord. They seem really fired up for the Lord. And then all of a sudden they're not. Because this includes not just your public persona, but your thought life at home and in secret. That's the mystery. It's not what we see that is mysterious. It's what we don't see of one another that makes us a very complex formula. The devil cannot make a Christian do it if they are relying on the Lord. If you bow to the devil and you do wrong, if you cheat, lie, steal, commit adultery, uh, uh, whatever, then you are a volunteer. You have to resist the devil in your actions, where you go, what you watch, what you think about. The philosophies that you entertain, and, and, and I'm going to get into that. We are called to be holy, to be separate, to flee sin. Sinful feelings, sinful thoughts, sinful people, sinful actions. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God. We have confidence because of the love that Jesus showed on the cross. When we are showing love to one another, our love, God's plan is complete in us, and we can have confidence. And we need it, because the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Do you believe that? I probably don't need to make a case for this, but I'm going to. Be warned, Christian. If you're not getting it from the Bible, if it is a philosophy that does not originate out of the Bible, 
then it is under the sway of the evil one. Radical philosophies in our world today. Let me name a couple. Critical race theory. LGBTQ philosophy are anti-Bible, they are atheistic, and they are focused on pushing the Creator God and Jesus thought, thinking about God, considering God, considering right and wrong, they're pushing them out. Especially morality and the cross, don't think about it. All right? Critical race theory is not about human responsibility. The core of your faith, the center of your faith is that you have sinned against God and you're responsible for what you do. But Jesus has made a way on the cross for that penalty to be paid for you. All right? Critical race theory says people are not responsible for their actions. It separates people into oppressors and oppressed. And the oppressed are not responsible for their actions. Only the oppressors are responsible. If that is not a lie, if that is not under the sway of the wicked one, then I have nothing to tell you. If you cannot see that that is evil and unbiblical, I can't help you. Period. Now, I'm not talking about uh, race things or any of that. It has nothing to do with that. Critical race theory has nothing to do with race. They freely take people of different races and categorize them together as oppressors. And they freely take people of different races and categorize them as oppressed. And then they have different rules for each of them. And if that's true, then God is not just. And the cross will do you no good. Because you're not responsible. If you, can, if you can work your way to the oppressed side of the aisle, then you are not responsible for your actions. That is under the sway of the devil. LGBTQ. I am not talking about gay people. Gay people are sinful just like me, and they need Jesus just like I do. Period. When I say LGBTQ, I'm talking about a lie, a philosophical lie that says, I sat in a classroom... I had to take a seminary class in 2011 that was not a Southern Baptist seminary. It was part of our accreditation. They called in a gay theologian. And they said, we, we showed them in the Bible where homosexuality was okay and Christians just ignored us. All right? They did not show because it does not say that. We ignored them because that is a lie and it does not say that homosexuality is okay in the Bible. Anywhere. All right? That is, there is exogesis, which what we do, we try to take out the meaning of the text every week. That's what you get from me, exogesis. Not Rex's personality, but what the Bible says. And there is isogesis, where you put what you think into the Bible. You read it in. If you can get homosexuality in there, it ain't exogesis. Now, I've got sexual sin in my life, and I'm going to answer for it on Judgment Day. Thank goodness the blood of Jesus will cover my sin. Gay people are just like me. They need Jesus. Period. That's it. And I, I, I have gay people that I, that I love and I am related to. They need Jesus, just like I do. I'm talking about a radical philosophy. And what they said in this class is, we can't show them in the Bible, so you know what we're going to do next? We're going to get rid of the binary system. Do you know what that is? Male and female. All right. I've been confused about a great many things in my life. I have doubted God's existence. I have doubted almost everything I know. You know what I haven't doubted? If I'm male or female. I'll tell you what. If, if you don't believe in the flood, just line up with this, this nonsense that there's no male and female, and you'll get to see it again. Because that is chaos. The flood is chaos, and you take away male and female, and why? What is the end game for taking away male and female? So we can't say homosexuality is wrong. All right? Let me say again. I have sinned sexually in my life, 
and I will pay for it at Judgment Day. I am no different than any gay person. Gay people need the Lord just like I do. But a philosophy that says there is no male and female is a lie. And if you can't see the lie in that, again, I can't, I can't help you. And so I, Sarah tells me that I say radical philosophies and I don't name them. Have I spoken clearly? These things are dangerous not just because they are anti-God and atheistic. They are dangerous to everybody. They, you don't have to believe the Bible to take away male and female as a danger. Now, does that mean that we don't have some things to work on? Yes, we have things to work on. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. Sin separates us from God. And what did it just say? Get saved and then get to work on these problems. Few people consciously worship the wicked one. None of these people that, I, none of these philosophies in general, do those people go, you know, I'm going to make up something because I want to worship Satan. I'm going to make up a lie philosophy. But worshiping stuff other than God is under the sway of the wicked one. And there is no way that a Christian can reconcile those radical philosophies with the Bible. You choose one or the other. I draw the line in the sand. You choose one or the other. And I'll tell you what, again, me and gay people should be on the same side on that argument. It's a danger to all of us. Matthew 10, here's what Jesus said. And this was Jesus, let me make the point. This is the temptation when he finally told us Satan to go on. Jesus used what to argue with the devil? He used scripture, and he was praying continually. Read the story throughout. He was praying and reading. Are you fighting against the devil? Are you just keeping your mouth shut and going about your business? Jesus said to the devil, be gone, get out, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and you shall only, and him only shall you serve. Okay? And if you worship God, you try to read his word and pray to him and know right and wrong. Be holy, be separate. Second, examine your thought life and do not even accidentally align yourself with these teachings. Not just those. Those are just really relevant examples of dangerous teachings. Go through with a filter. And you do this when you read the Bible, you use the Bible to help you filter through what you think. That's why it's there. And you go through and examine, am I aligning myself with God or am I aligning myself with this world under the sway of the wicked one? But let me say a good word. I may not, I may not be able to calm down. Don't panic. This ain't a new game. I can rant about it. But it's not because we just thought any of this up. We talked about this this morning. All these ways of thinking are ancient. Everything I have talked about is an ancient way of thinking. Rather than Marxism and communism, read uh, Pagan Kings in there. They've been, we've been doing this philosophy about, I don't know about, uh, this man and female stuff may be new. But it is, that is an assault on uh, Genesis 126. In his image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You can't have both. But they were predicted in the Bible. 3,600 years ago, it was written down. Sarah and I were listening to Leviticus on uh, this week. And they were telling all kind of awful stuff that the Israelites were not supposed to do when they went in the land. Sexual stuff. So she said, you don't reckon them people did all them things? She, she said, if they were in the Bible, they must have been doing them. I said, we ain't learned no new tricks. We just got a little, we can just carry it into our private thing and watch it. If we can't participate, we can watch it now easily. But do not panic. God isn't surprised by any of this. That's why he didn't save Jesus till you know, the 20th century to send him because we've been needing Jesus a long time, all the way back.
Do not put your faith in politics or politicians. Politics is part of the world system. Now, the, the book of Judges has a dual um, idea, I think. In the book of Judges, it says, every man did what was right in his eyes, and the Israelites are about to disappear because of their wickedness. The, the Philistines are about to overwhelm them. They've got to have a king, King David, in order to survive. But Samuel goes out of his way to say, that's a bad thing. Same thing with politics. Do not put your faith in politics or politicians, but we have the right to vote in this country still. And those things that I have criticized, those philosophies are going to take away the right to vote if they get, if they get their way. And so have, vote while you can. And you should pray and you should vote uh, as best you can. But do not put your faith in politics because even after the United States disappears, we're going to still be called to love the Lord and be Christians, no matter what the government is. All right? And finally, a war another warning about politics. If you spend more time and energy thinking about politics, no matter what it is, than you do on prayer and scripture, you will not recognize the Antichrist when he comes. Because he's going to come in a way that you think, okay, this guy's the answer. And he's going to sneak up on all of us. Prepare now. Prepare your heart and your faith now for that. That is coming. That day is coming. The day is coming. And if you wait till then to start trying to get your spiritual ducks in a row and start learning about truth and non-truth, it's going to be too late. All right, trust the essentials of biblical faith. I mean, it, all this works together. Every word in this verse is, is critical, so I've tried to highlight them. 1 John 5.20, we know. Do you know? Do you know that the Son of God has come? Okay, so that's your first step. Get to where you are confident and you know that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was sent by God for all of us do you know that? The Son of God. God became a man. Not just a great teacher. Not just a loving person. Not just a wise man. But God became a man. Do you know that Jesus came? That Messiah prophesied for thousands of years and he was a living, breathing Fully God, fully man. Why did he come? come? To give us understanding. All these things. Listen, there's no way you can recognize a lie if you don't know the truth. Okay? So for us to be wise, as and eventually Christianity is going to be illegal. That's what the Bible says. If you do not... If you do not know the truth of God, you'll probably think, well, that's a good thing. Because Christian, Christians are mostly hypocrites and bigots and uh, uh, all kind of awful things. That we may know him who is true. Him is Jesus. That is the center of what we believe. That is the center of God's truth. That is God's plan from the beginning. There was never a time... That Jesus was not on the table, coming eventually. There was never a time that God said, you know what? This doesn't seem to be working out with the Israelites. Maybe I should send a Messiah. No. That we may know Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, who is true. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And we are in him who is true. That is salvation. It's not something we have knowledge about. It's not something uh, that is a, a proposition, an important proposition. We become a part of that truth. We dwell in Christ. 
Our identity should become Jesus. Our whole identity is Jesus. I do the things I do because he gave me life. In his son, Jesus, the Messiah, this is the true God and the eternal life. And finally, the final word is stay away from idols. What does he mean by that? He's John, first John, the last verse in 1 John, verse 21, little children. And as I say, that is the most affectionate. That is my beloved child. That is meant not to put us down, but in the kindest, most loving way. Church, my little children. Keep yourself from idols. Amen. Truly. Now, what is an idol today? Well, here's my analogy. You've heard it before. There is only one throne, one seat on top of every heart. Only one occupant on the throne at any given time. And we were created. The reason that you breathe, the reason your heart beats, is for God to sit there on that throne. That's your created purpose. All people. No matter where they end up, all people were created to have God sitting on the top as the top priority of their heart. If it is not God sitting on your throne, even for a short time, even for a minute, even for a second, then it is an idol. It doesn't mean that an idol is inherently evil. I'll tell you, if you love your spouse as you are supposed to love your spouse, they're very high up on that list. But if they sit on the throne, then they are an idol. If they are the reason that you love God and not the opposite, then that your spouse is an idol. God is to be on the throne. Coming to church can be an idol. Praying can be an idol. If God is not the reason that you do those things. How often, I ask you, in a week, does God sit on the throne of your heart? How often is God the thing that is at the top? That you are conscious that God is the reason I'm doing this. And if he does, how long does he sit there? Before something else begins taking your attention and your passion away from him. Of course, we are not called to sit in a monastery and pray all day. We are meant to live our lives. So there are distractions. But what we need to work on is a continual God consciousness that as you do the things of your life, whatever they are, that God is the reason that you're doing them, that you are aware of his presence, that you are walking with him as you do all those things. What we are called to do as believers, according to 1 John, is grow a habit of evaluating each and everything that we do, each element of our life, in light of Jesus' sacrifice and God's big purpose. Everything. If we do that, then that's living the 1 John life. That is experiencing our faith in Jesus Christ with God on the throne of our heart. Let's pray. God, we ask for your help. So many things to distract us. God, help us to grow in your image and experience and live and walk our faith in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks,